It's my job to actually look at the variants that we're generating with all of this sequencing data and decide what the impact of those variants is and how likely they are to be causing a patient's condition and then decide what they expect back to patients. So I'm going to be introducing some quite complicated concepts um, and hopefully explain them to you all in a way that um, is understandable and I'm happy to take questions at the end. So it helps you start to think about what does a genome actually look like. And if you want to see a genome, you can go down to the um, Wellcome collection just opposite Euston Station in London and actually have a look at the human genome. Because there you'll find printed out all six billion um, letters of the human genome in a volume of over 100 books. Um, however, on a more um, visual basis, the genome actually looks more like this. Um, so we have a sequence, those six billion bases are comprised of just four different letters, A, C, G and T, which are the four nucleotides that make up our DNA. These together with a phosphate backbone are packaged up into um, a structure that's probably familiar to all of you called a double helix. And then that double helix of DNA is further packaged up in a very specific and ordered way, such that all six billion um, bases will fit into um, every single cell in your body. They're packaged up into chromosomes and you have 23 pairs of these in every single cell in your body. So this is what chromosomes look like down the microscope um, and we, we can look at these um, via a te technique called cytogenetics. You're looking at um, a cell that's been arrested in a particular stage, stage of the cell division cycle called metaphase and this is the point at which the chromosomes are most condensed and, and easiest for us to see. And then they've been, the cell's been burst open to reveal the chromosomes and they've been stained with um, specific chemicals which reveals a very particular banding pattern such that every chromosome has a very characteristic banding pattern that can be recognised by um, skilled staff. Um, the chromosomes are then paired up and ordered in um, what we could refer to as a carrier type. And this, this process of um, staining the chromosomes is actually called G-banding. So cytogenetics is like the, the, the real archetypal genomic technology. It's a way of looking at the entire genome all in one go, but it will only um, reveal very gross aberrations involving the chromosomes. So one of these, to show you an example of the kind of thing we do, is um, illustrated here. So this is the um, carrier type of a little girl. We know it's a girl because there are two copies of the X chromosome and no copies of the Y. And you can see straight away that we've got three copies of chromosome 21 here. Um, that's also known as trisomy 21 or more familiarly Down syndrome. So if we had a baby born with a suspicion of Down syndrome, a sample of blood would be sent off to our laboratory. We'd look at the chromosomes down the microscope and if we see three copies of 21 we can confirm that um, clinical diagnosis. Another example comes from cancer. This time um, we're talking about acquired genetic disease. In this case, we've got um, a translocation between chromosomes 4 and 11, such that the long arm of chromosome 4, so this is the normal 4, but the long arm of this um, one of the pair has actually translocated onto the bottom of chromosome 11, and we've got the reciprocal process, so the, the little bit at the bottom of 11, the long arm has gone onto chromosome 4. So we've got now a new derived chromosome 4 and a derived chromosome 11. Um, the effect of this translocation is that the genes located at the breakpoints, so sort of here and here, have been disrupted in some way, um, and the, the, the consequences of the protein is also disrupted, um, and it had, um, this has led to it having oncogenic potential and has led to the formation of um, the leukemia. And it's really important that we, that the reason we want to know this is partly because um, we can diagnose a specific type of leukemia. But even more than that, we can even, um, we're even able to say what kind of therapies are likely to work best. So this is, um, this is why we use chromosome analysis, not just for people think of it perhaps traditionally for diagnosing inherited genetic diseases, but we use it an awful lot in cancer as well. So that was the um, looking at chromosomes. When they're easily visible down the microscope, we can band them and, um, and trained analysts can look for aberrations. But in some situations, that's just not possible, either because cells aren't actively dividing or because the kind of aberrations we're looking for perhaps just involve the very tips, tips of the chromosomes right down here. 
and it's just not possible to actually see that. They're, they're what we call cytogenetic decryptic. So then we can use another technique, a really powerful, te powerful technique called fluorescent in situ hybridization or molecular cytogenetics. Um, this particular example here is a lovely illustration of the technical, well, I should point out it's not commonly used in um, diagnostic labs, but it shows you what the technique can do. So we've been able to label up every single pair of chromosomes with a different colour so that we, they can be easily recognised um, down the microscope. So if you have say a, a tiny little bit of one chromosome translocated to the end of another one, it's revealed by the colour, what would be invisible, sort of more to the, um, the when you do a G-band analysis. This slide also shows the difference between cells at different stages in the cell cycle. So these cells are in the metaphase and the chromosomes are, are nicely condensed and um, they've actually been split out of this, split open from a cell and released and spread out on a slide such that we can see them like this. However, at another stage in the cell cycle, called interphase, this is what the chromosomes look like inside the cell. They're much more spread out, and you can see from the colours that um, the genetic material is um, diffusely spread um, throughout the cell. The chromosomes are just a big tangle. So again, this is where this technique of fish comes in, because we're still able to analyse um, cells in this interphase, even if we can't generate metaphase chromosomes by applying um, fish probes to them. So I've illustrated that with the next uh, picture. So here's um, a probe to a gene on the Y chromosome seen in metaphase, where you can still recognize the Y chromosome, this tiny little chromosome down here. But you, you, you are also able to look at cells in the interphase of the cell cycle, and there's the Y chromosome down there. And this technique is very good if we just want to um, do a quick count. And we, um, we can just count the number of copies of Y or any other chromosome or any other gene which is um, relevant in certain situations. We can take that technique even further and um, use differential, differentially coloured probes. I don't know how well you can see this, but here we've got a probe to a gene on chromosome 9 coloured in red and another probe to a gene on chromosome 22 coloured green. This is the normal 22, this is the normal 9, and you'll have to believe me here, but the signals on this particular chromosome 9, this is the, the, two, this is the pair of 9s here, these signals um, are slightly less intense than this one. And a little bit of the signal here is actually moved onto this chromosome 22 down here. And where the red and the green are now co-located, the signal appears yellow. So what this tells us is that we've had a translocation between this chromosome 9 and this chromosome 22. And the result of this translocation is that the, the genes of the two breakpoints are fused together to create a new chimeric protein which has oncogenic potential. And this particular um, uh, genetic aberration called translocation 922 is characteristic of chronic myeloid leukemia. It's actually how we diagnose chronic myeloid leukemia. Um, and because it's so characteristic, the derived chromosome 22 has its own name. It's called a Philadelphia chromosome. So again, by, by having a sample sent in to us with a suspected diagnosis and looking down the microscope, we can confirm that this is indeed chronic myeloid leukemia and suggest the most appropriate course of treatment for this patient. So moving on from um, the gross chromosomal um, aberrations and delving down more into the actual DNA sequence itself, um, I just thought it would be worth reminding everyone how the um, genetic apparatus, apparatus is actually um, works and how the sequence is read and um, the code is understood by the cell in the formation of a protein. So um, triplets of bases or nucleotides form what's known as a codon and each codon codes for a different amino acid and it's the sequence of amino acids that make up a protein. So a very simplistic example here is a substitution in the sequence of a thymine for an adenine. So this codon originally coded for a cysteine amino acid, but now the sequence has changed from TGT to AGT. So the amino acid coded for now is a serine. So we've got a change in one single amino acid in this protein. The consequences of this are completely variable. Often these kinds of changes are tolerated by the cell. There's no consequence to the protein. You can, every single one of us contains thousands of these types of changes. Um, and, and this is what's responsible for the differences between 
the normal differences between us all. However, at the other end of the scale, the consequence could be completely devastating, and it could be just this single type of change here that will stop the protein from perhaps um, folding properly or functioning properly, and could actually be, um, the consequence could be a very serious genetic condition. So the types of changes we're looking for, the very small changes, are perhaps um, best illustrated by the analogy of a set of instructions in a book. And if we start with a very simple sentence, the fat red fox can hop, there are various different changes that can happen. The first of these is a substitution, which is like a spelling mistake. Um, and here you can still read the sentence, but its meanings change slightly. And the, the consequence of that to the cell is that it could still understand that sentence and there'd be no real phenotypic effect, or it could change it completely and, and it no longer works properly. So after substitutions, we then come to deletions. Now, um, you can have what's known as an in-frame deletion, which is, in this case, we've deleted three letters, but the sentence can still be read and make sense. Paradoxically, if we only delete one letter rather than three, this throws the reading frame out, and the sentence is now gobbledygook, and you can't read it anymore. So this is a sort of nice illustration of how just one single change, one single letter missing can have such a dramatic effect. Um, the sort of converse of deletions and insertions, and again, if you've got an insertion of just a single nucleotide, you throw out your reading frame and your sentence no longer makes sense. And then, um, slightly bigger than insertions, we could have a duplication. So in this case, we've duplicated um, one whole word and we can still read the sentence, or we duplicate four letters and then throw the reading frame out. So I hope you can start to see, uh, um, the reason I put this slide up is that, you know, it just shows just that one single change in your six billion letters can have such a devastating impact and be the, the cause of either cancer or a, a, a nasty genetic condition. So when we're looking for variation um, in the genome at the sequence level, we're looking for everything from single base changes right up to perhaps whole extra chromosomes. And traditionally, we've had to use a, a variety of techniques in the genetics lab um, to be able to find um, all of these different types of changes um, at different orders of magnitude of um, scale. Um, but what we really want to be able to do this most efficiently with the highest diagnostic yield um, at, at, limit, at um, reduced cost is one technique that will fit all. And we finally have such a technique which is um, showing great promise now to be able to do all of these things. And that technique is known as next generation sequencing and that's what the rest of my talk is really going to be about. So next generation sequencing, the reason it's so important is it is completely changing the way we deliver healthcare. And in a nutshell, what it what it does is it decodes the DNA and produces the precise order of the four component bases. But the difference between next generation sequencing and what's gone before, um, and bear in mind we've used a process called SAMA sequencing for decades, with next generation sequencing we can actually sequence billions of DNA fragments in parallel in one go. So it's very high throughput and it means that we can now sequence an entire human genome in one run as Tom's already alluded to. So within the, the clinical lab, we used, um, as I said, Sanger sequencing for a long time now. However, the throughput of that is we're pretty low. We can sequence 96 fragments per gram on one of these plates. That's equivalent to about 75,000 bases of DNA. So in practice, that means we could perhaps look at 96 different patients for one single exon, or maybe screen a whole gene for just one patient. Um, one run at a time. However, with the bench top next generation sequencing apparatus that we have access to in the lab, we can now look at 20 million fragments per run, so orders of magnitude greater than what's gone before. Um, this is the equivalent of looking at 20,000 of these plates simultaneously, so the amount of data we're generating is huge. Um, 15,000 million bases in one go. So this enables us to screen gene panels for, num for a number of patients in one go or potentially look at um, a whole exome, which is the entire coding sequence of your DNA. 
So it's given us a huge increase in our sequencing app, which is completely revolutionising our clinical services. Um, so talking about how we're going to use next generation sequencing in our clinical labs, which we're, we're moving across from calling genetics labs to genomic laboratories, we've got questions to ask. Is it more appropriate to look at the whole genome? Or could we get away with just looking at the, the coding part of the genome, that um, one to five percent of the genome that actually makes the protein, which is known as the exome? Or is it more appropriate to concentrate on specific gene panels? Um, and there are, I'll, I'll illustrate this on another slide in a minute, but the, the different strategies are used in different situations. So, for example, to illustrate why we might go um, straight onto gene panels. For a patient referred with hereditary cardiomyopathy, there are up to 70 genes involved in that condition. So it's more appropriate perhaps just to design a gene panel and look at those 70 genes. Um, that's the most, most cost-effective way of doing things as it stands, but in time that may well change. Whereas if we're thinking about whether to look at whole exomes or whole genomes, um, just to illustrate the differences of why uh, why we may choose one over the other. As I've already said, an exome comprises just the coding region of your, um, your genome. That's about 20,000 genes and makes up between one and five percent of your genome. This will generate about 30 megabases of um, DNA, as opposed to whole genome sequencing, which gives you 100 times more output. Um, by using exome sequencing, you will discover about 85% of your disease-causing variants in um, Mendelian conditions, which are those where the inheritance pattern is, has been well worked out. Whereas whole genome sequencing gives you the potential to detect all of your disease-causing variants. With whole exome sequencing, your output will be about 30,000 variants. So at the end of that process, you, you're left with 30,000 variants that you then need to decide, what do I do with these? and I'll come on to that in a minute, whereas with whole genome sequencing, the figure is more like three million. So that's the challenge, <laughs> that's, what we, we, that's the problem we face. And then um, in the rest of my talk, I'll go on and say how we're actually getting around that challenge. So just to recap on the, on the, the strategy right from the beginning, you need to take into account the, the phenotype and whether it's well, well described how much money you have, what kind of sensitivity you need to go down to. So for cancer, we're, we're needing very high levels of sensitivity when we're looking at um, clones in tumours. How many patient numbers you've got. So obviously the 100,000 genomes project gives you volume and enables you to reduce your costs massively. Um, so we can either employ gene panels, which may be appropriate for specific presentations such as breast cancer, where we only want to look at a limited number of genes. For more heterogeneous conditions such as developmental delay, it's perhaps more appropriate to sequence the coding region known as a clinical exome. Or as we've already um, heard from Tom, the 100,000 Genomes Project is enabling us just to go in straight in and look at the entire genome and then select virtual panels out of that that we apply more scrutiny to. So again, um, this is the problem. Three billion um, billion letters um, and what do we do with all of that data? So to generate the, the, the actual data, the process that we um, employ um, illustrated here, we have to start off with a specimen. So if we're looking for germline um, variants, we start off with blood or saliva or other tissue. But in cancer, we actually need a little bit of the tumour. We're obviously trying to sequence the, um, the, uh, the genetic content of the tumour. We then extract nucleic acid, usually this is DNA, sometimes RNA if we're interested in expression. Then this is a key part of the process, we prepare our library and this determines how much of the genome we're going to be looking at. So it could be the whole genome or we could just pull out the exome or we may just want to look at gene panels and the way we do this is illustrated here. So if we start off with the entire genome then we can apply, um, we can do what's known as target enrichment to pull out, for example, just cardiac genes, just breast cancer genes, just, deaf, just the deafness genes, or the entire coding region, or look at the whole genome. That's sort of how we do it. So moving on to the sequencing process itself, um, there are loads of different chemistry and platforms that we can use to do this. Um, but generally speaking, 
we um, what the, the process itself sequences in short fragments, which we call beads, which can be between 75 and 300 base pairs. And then they have to be mapped back to a reference genome so that they can be ordered and we can make sense of them. So that's the first part of the bioinformatics pipeline, is mapping back all these reads back to the reference genome. Then the BI pipeline um, will call any variants and highlight them to us. And then we do some further bioinformatics to actually annotate those variants to decide what the, um, the consequences are likely to be and finally um, to assign pathogenicity to them um, basically to make a decision. Are they just part of normal variation? Can we write them off as benign variants or are they actually likely to be responsible for these conditions? That, that really is the hardest part, believe me. I think we've probably got the sequencing side of things sus. Yeah, it would be nice if it was cheaper. This is the really difficult bit now. This is what the next generation sequencing data actually looks like. Um, so this is how it's presented to me. This is a, 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 a browser that we use. So these are all the reads here. This is why it's called parallel sequencing, because we generate loads and loads of these different reads, which are, are really quite short, as I said, between 75 and 150 base pairs. The, the bioinformatics lines it back up to the genome. So all of these reads here come from just this little region. This is chromosome 18 here across the top, just a part of chromosome 18. This is the central area of 18. And all these regions come from just this, this little bit here, which is the GATA6 gene. Um, down here at the bottom, we've got the sequence of amino acids and the sequence of nucleotides. And what we can see here is the, the software is highlighting a variant. And this variant is actually a change in a single base from an adenine to a guanine. Um, and the consequence of that is to change the amino acid sequence. And, and actually, this is a, a pathogenic mutation. So that's, that's what it actually looks like. So one of the ways we actually can um, start to hone in on the, the regions of interest and, and to make sense of all of this data is to apply, apply panels. In the, the genetics diagnostics lab, um, all of our familial cancer patients go down one single panel. Um, so we look at 94 genes implicated in hereditary cancer in one go through one pipeline. It's a very streamlined process. We can get DNA to data in just three days through a single technical workflow. And then we apply virtual gene panels to this, such that all of the patients go through a filtering process and we only look at the genes of interest at the end. So the breast cancer patients, whilst they get sequenced for all of those genes, we'll only actually look at the breast cancer genes and in that way limit the number of variants we're left with at the end. So the, um, the variants that we see may be false calls as a result of the sequencing process itself and then as artifacts. And the BI, the, the bioinformatics helps us to decide which of these it's going to be, whether it's a false call, whether it's likely to just be benign variation. Sometimes the variants just have uncertain clinical significance and we have to decide whether to report those back, um, report those out or hold them back. Or ultimately what we're really looking for are the, the likely pathogenic mutations which will be reported back to the patients. And there are various databases and tools online that we use to make these decisions. So um, that's how we deal with um, gene panels. And then when we talk about um, the, the results of whole genome sequencing, we're dealing with vastly hugely increased amounts of data. So the way we deal with this is to take our three billion bases, which are sequenced by either the, the germline in a rare disease or the somatic tumor in cancer. And then we can, we can actually subtract from the cancer the germline variants, and that automatically limits the amount of data we're left with to look at. For rare disease, if we've got um, a, a de novo condition and we have both parents, we could subtract the parental variants because we know the parents aren't affected. And again, that leaves us with a more limited pool of variants. We can then apply some virtual panels, and that will give us, a, a, again, a reduced number of variants at the end of the pipeline, which are then annotated, filtered, and prioritised. So um, when it comes to rare diseases, the genetic variants are filtered based on such things as their frequency. So if it's a rare disease, the variant itself needs to be rare. And its location, which must, which um, is inside a known gene um, panel containing genes associated with that condition. Um, its genotype, its inheritance pattern, and its predictive consequence. So that this is probably the most important slide to go through and describes how we actually filter. So if we have a, a variant, 
What we need to know is that the Guardian Tablet is not commonly found in the generally, general healthy population. We can use population databases to make that assessment. And the allelic state matches the known mode of inheritance for the, the gene and the disorder. If the answer to those questions is yes, we then start to look at the consequence of that variant. If it's a known pathogenic mutation, it goes straight down into tier one and that gets reported back to us from um, the 100,000 Genomes Project back to the genomic medicine centres. If it's um, a protein truncating um, variant, even if it's not been reported before, that follows the same path. And then if it's on a, one of the genes on our virtual panel, it either goes into tier one or tier three, which I'll just skip through in a minute. However, if it's protein altering rather than protein truncating, this is slightly more difficult to, um, to deduce what the effect might be. And in this case, it's tiered as a, a tier two rather than a, a tier one, which means the effect is less likely. We have to do a bit more work to decide what the effect might be. So very quickly, tiers one and tier two. Um, tier one are the known pathogenic variants or the prote protein truncating variants. And um, these come back to the genomic medicine centers. We do a bit more work just to make sure that we're, we're happy that they are responsible for the genetic condition and will get reported back to the patients. Whereas tier two variants, we may have to do a lot more work to assign pathogenicity to them or discount them as a likely benign variant. Tier three variants, so the ones where we really don't know um, about them and, and it's unlikely we'll be looking at these at this stage or then in the future we'll perhaps pay them a bit more scrutiny. So um, just to summarise, the, the way that we've adopted next generation sequencing in clinical genomic services, um, we've employed it because it's in, dramatically increased the amount of sequencing data we have access to at reduced cost, which means that we can look at um, more patients, reduce our reporting times, many more genomic targets, increasing our diagnostic yield, so it really has been an answer to the demands of genomic medicine. So, um, as to the future, um, will we be doing whole genome sequencing for everybody? And at what point will we be screening everybody at birth? Those ethical questions I'm not prepared to answer, but they're, they're things that have been mooted and discussed. The one thing I would say is that whole genome sequencing is great, but it can't do everything yet. It doesn't provide all the answers. So, for example, if we're monitoring a particular area I'm involved in, is monitoring the um, residual disease in leukemia, and I, I can't see any a way in which at the current costs and so forth we can do that with next generation sequencing um, but that's not to say it's not changing the way we deliver um, genomic services so um, thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions and sorry that was rushed at the end <laughs>
the direction that we do in the rest of the, the NHS, which is where, you know, if you do see dark mass on a, a, a long uh, X-ray, then you, you will report that. The, the bit that's kind of where I sort of think people get caught up in about this is the, the issue of how certain you are that something means something. Uh, and that's, you know, people are often debating this, where you actually go, well, you're, you're not 100% sure, so actually is it a finding or isn't it? Uh, and I think we often tie ourselves up in knots when actually the technical bit says, well, no, we're not ready to report on this yet. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So, generally speaking, I would say with, the, with anything in the rare disease programme where we're dealing with um, uh, constitutional genetic conditions, be they hereditary or de novo, generally speaking, people don't report back variants of unknown significance because it's, it's of no use and it could be, have the potential to be misinterpreted. Those boundaries aren't quite so clear with cancer because even if we don't know exactly the function of something, it could still mean that the patient could potentially receive a treatment that could still work, so it all starts to become a bit more 